On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including SpaceX has built a new launch pad for Starship, Falcon Heavy completes its biggest mission yet, and Sierra Space wins a Space Force contract for a secret engine design. This is the Space Race. Progress at the launch facilities at the SpaceX testing grounds in Boca Chica, Texas hit another milestone on July 28th when the company technicians completed a full-strength test of their newly installed water deluge system. SpaceX observers have been following the progress of the deluge system's construction for the last several weeks now. The huge metal plate forming the central shower head of this system, as well as the outward plates protecting the water hookups, were installed at the end of June and into the beginning of July, causing a fair amount of excitement. A lot of speculation had been buzzing around the community, and folks like Ryan Hansen were rightfully happy to see that their thoughts on the device and its proportions were mostly correct. Then on July 17th, before the apparatus had been completely installed, the SpaceX team conducted their first test, and even with a missing water tank, the plates put out an impressive flood of water. The very next week, on July 26, the remaining tank and pressure vessels were installed and linked into the last hookups under the orbital launch mount. In the background of all this was the testing of Booster 9. More on that later, but the important thing to note here is that SpaceX had a launch candidate booster on the stand above their new deluge system, an opportunity which was too good to pass up. And on July 28th, they turned the water on. We were treated to some great footage from SpaceX themselves, and in it, we can see that at full power, the deluge system works more or less the same way the simulations predicted it would. A colossal amount of water is shot upwards and outwards from the center of the OLM, avoiding hitting the engines of the booster sitting directly above the plate, even though the water is jetting out of the system so hard that it was shot clear over the tank farm's protective berm. Luckily, the site's drainage seems to have taken care of everything just fine, so this was a very successful test. The deluge system is fully operational. Now, whether or not it's able to effectively manage the liftoff thrust of Super Heavy will have to be discovered in testing. During the April 20th flight test, Super Heavy's massive array of Raptor V2 engines tore a deep crater into the launch pad under the OLM, launching concrete debris into the launch tower and much further afield. SpaceX had designed a water-cooled steel plate to sit under the OLM to absorb all the heat and pressure, but it hadn't been built in time for the test, and the engineering team underestimated the damage Super Heavy was capable of. Now, in their defense, the physics behind rocket jet plumes and cratering is still being worked out by leading physicists in the field, so it's not an easy thing to predict by any stretch. The basic premise is that a steel plate on concrete could likely take the beating that an array of Raptor V2s would dish out. The heat is another matter, but the water should take care of that, in theory. And now that we've seen it in action, it's hard to think that this reverse showerhead idea won't do the trick. But we won't have to guess for long, as the next thing the SpaceX team is likely gunning for is a static fire right on the OLM. And given how quickly the rest of the site's work is progressing, it seems possible that we might be seeing one of these by the end of August at the latest. The build team needs to let that concrete fully cure, but with the deluge plate working, they may not have to worry about that so much. That being said, there are a couple of other things standing in the way of a static fire, and of course, another test launch. The first is testing the OLM and booster systems. The launch apparatus took a beating on April 20th, and the repairs have gone well, but still need to be tested to make sure they are operational. Going with that, the new launch candidate, Booster 9, has to go through the usual process to ensure it can handle being the next booster to try and get Starship into space. On July 23rd, Booster 9 was put through cryogenic proof testing, the test where the team fills the booster's fuel tanks with liquid nitrogen to test pressure stability and the plumbing. Some of you might remember that the Super Heavy uses liquid methane, but doing a pressure cryo test with such a volatile fuel is not exactly the smartest thing to do on your only launch apparatus, so they use nitrogen, which, while not being quite as dense as methane, won't explode if something bad happens during the tanking procedures. Another blocker to launch is the modifications needed for hot staging, the process SpaceX has recently decided to add to Starship. A large ring of vents and tank shields will sit in between the first and second stage, allowing Starship's engines to start up before fully separating from its Super Heavy booster, leading to a smoother separation maneuver. But Booster 9 and Ship 25 
don't have this modification, and the quick disconnect for the fuel line on the launch tower has already been raised to accommodate for the new height. So SpaceX is going to have to install these vents before even committing to a full wet dress rehearsal with the new stack. So where is it? Luckily, the folks at What About It managed to catch sight of a Starship ring segment that looked a bit different from what we're used to. That coupled with the fact that Ship 27, which was recently disassembled, had some of its parts sent back to the production tents instead of being scrapped in the rocket garden. It makes a lot of sense for the SpaceX engineers to recycle an unused Starship prototype for this purpose, so we could see a whole new Starship or, more likely, a modified end piece that will be swapped on to a ready-to-fly Starship. But the real blocker right now is likely the FAA investigation, which still hasn't been completed and will likely have a list of demands for changes that SpaceX will have to complete before even test firing a rocket at Boca Chica. Once again, we'll have to wait and see what those conditions might be, but in the meantime, SpaceX seems determined to put on a show. On July 28th, the Falcon Heavy launched into the sky on its seventh ever mission. The heavy lift rocket carries its enormous payload into space on its central booster, expending the entire thing to get into the correct geostationary orbit, while the rocket's twin side boosters made their usual picture-perfect landing back at Cape Canaveral. And what was riding inside the upper fairing of the Falcon Heavy this time? Well, the Jupiter-3 Echo Star 24 communications satellite. Coming in at a whopping 9 metric tons of load, there's not many rockets that could get the Jupiter-3 into orbit, much less geostationary. But that's what Falcon Heavy was built for, and it did the job, even if it had to use all the fuel in its central booster, so no recovery for that one. The Jupiter-3 was made to be a massive internet hub, expanding the HughesNet satellite service to a projected 80% of the people living across the Americas. It's equipped with 300 spot beams to achieve this sort of coverage, and reportedly has a 500 gigabits per second. The Falcon Heavy upper stage made three more burns to lift the satellite's orbit before detaching and leaving the rest of Jupiter's onboard propulsion, enough to get the vehicle into geostationary, where it can be the most useful. Echo Star leadership has said that geostationary orbit is the ideal height to project broadband signals from and has designed their Jupiter satellites to operate from those positions, more than 35,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Previous Jupiter Echo Star missions that were of similar size and had made use of both Ariane 5 and the ULA Atlas V rockets, both of which are no longer in service, leaving just the SpaceX Falcon Heavy. The current SpaceX heavy lift vehicle hasn't had much cause to be used. Friday's launch was only the third this year, compared to its smaller variant, the Falcon 9, which has already been up 50 times as of July 28th. To be fair, there aren't a whole lot of giant payloads to send into space right now. That's going to be changing, though, as soon as commercial companies start launching their own space stations, and by then, we might have access to the Starship but it's likely that Falcon Heavy will still be seeing some use for exactly this sort of mission, lifting large, custom-built apparatus into geostationary orbit. At least we hope so, because watching those boosters land side by side is never going to get old. Sierra Space is getting the funding they need to design a more efficient engine, which company leadership says will be the major driving force for their entire range of operations. From our applications and destinations sector to space transportation with our Dream Chaser plane. On July 25th, the Colorado based aerospace company confirmed that the US Air Force had just handed them a $22.6 million contract to finish the design and testing of their newest upper stage engine, the VR 35KA. The engine is designed to work on the orbital stages of rockets and so has a very good thrust efficiency using liquid hydrogen and oxygen fuels to produce 35,000 pounds force of thrust. Sierra Space's chief technology officer and vice president, Rusty Thomas, says that the VR35KA provides more thrust and higher performance in a smaller package than any other upper stage engine currently on the market. And knowing that their prototypes have already gone through some testing, they likely have the numbers to back that up. Back in August 2022, the company completed a critical design review, which apparently impressed the Air Force brass enough to hand them this new $22 million contract. Sierra has understandably not released much about the engine other than the use of a fuel-mixed stage combustion cycle and something called Vortex. 
A staged combustion cycle is when a small portion of an engine's propellant is fed into a pre-burner chamber. This ignites the small amount of mix into a fuel-rich gas and sends it into the turbines to get the power to the pumps before being fed into the main combustion chamber and burned with the rest of the mix. This is very easy on fuel use. Vortex is a bit of a mystery though. We are told that it refers to a thrust chamber design, which is meant to increase the pressure of the engine's exhaust in a smaller volume, but that's all we know. Thomas reports that this design will be able to deliver 30% more payload mass to orbit and will be used with their partner's launch vehicles, which is unsurprising. During an investor conference on June 27th, Sierra's executive spoke about the company's goals to build out a series of modules and vehicles so that they wouldn't have to rely on other companies to ferry their Dream Chaser space plane into orbit. And that is probably going to take a while to become reality, but a $22 million contract certainly gets them closer to that goal. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.